Hello World Wide Web, I'm Dagger Shadow, the internet personality best hair. Now, I know a lot of you were really requesting very hard for me to tackle Jurassic World to finish off Dino Number 2, the return of the revenge of the resurrection. But I kinda don't have the movie, and unlike certain critics, I don't like to review movies that I don't actually own. Merry Christmas! Well, uh, I guess we're reviewing Jurassic World, then. The newest movie in the Jurassic Park franchise as of the current year, coming out a whopping 14 years since Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World had the daunting task of trying to live up to the series' reputation, still strongly held by the first, despite what the sequels tried, and explain to newcomers almost everything about the franchise in the process. This is made a bit easier by the fact that it is a two-hour movie, which is surprising considering that studios anymore seem to be wondering whether or not you really need to do the full 90 minutes if, through cutting it back just a tad, you can squeeze some more screenings out of it. But point of it all is that Jurassic World harkens back to the original, as in Jurassic Park before Jurassic Park was even Jurassic Park. A commonly known piece of trivia about Jurassic Park is that one of the initial drafts Michael Crichton wrote was about a little boy in a dinosaur theme park when disaster strikes leading to death and destruction as the attractions roam free and begin killing everyone. That pretty much sums up the plotline of Jurassic World, barring some details on the origins of the crisis and other bits of subtext. Of course, that draft was never written because everyone Mike talked to about it fucking hated it. So... Oh, um, uh, let's take a look at Jurassic World and see if two decades and a few billion dollars make all the difference. The opening is the opening of several eggs, showing the audience right away that dinosaurs have begun to be cloned yet again, and will be unleashed on the world. I'm sure this time, though, they won't escape right away. Uh, okay, I understand CGI dinosaurs. I mean, it's kind of hard to film a real one, but I got birds in my fucking backyard right now. That's not an impressive enough shot for you. I got squirrels doing goddamn acrobatics. How much did that CGI bird cost to do? I mean, I don't mean to brag, but it seems like random junk on my hard drive beats it. I suppose it was to segue from the extinct dinosaurs to living dinosaurs and introduce our little kid for this movie. Ray? Oh, that's right, I gotta check IMDB for the actor names. What the hell? When the fuck did IMDB turn into IGN? Anyway, this is Gray, played by Ty Simpkins. Naming a child in your PG-13 family adventure movie after a badly written sexual icon of erotic fiction wouldn't be my first choice, but I'm sure the focus groups had good reasons. He even has a brother, Zach, played by Nick Robinson. Call me every day and text me pics so I don't forget what you look like. Text? Pictures? I don't know how good he is at ASCII art, but okay. Now, the point of it all is they're going on a trip. A great big trip, you see. They're going to Jurassic World! Alone. But that's okay, because they're actually the nephews of the woman in charge of the park. So when they arrive at the end of their journey and the beginning of their adventure... Where's Aunt Claire? Working? It's like thousands of people walking around she has to take care of. I know she clones dinosaurs for a living, but when you start cloning humans, people get all uppity. For a while, not too much happens here, just sweeping establishing shots while the kids are meekly kept in check by their guide, Zara, played by Katie McGrath. So, fuck this, let's move on to the work being done by the boy's aunt, Claire, played by Bryce Dallas Howard. As it happens, the park has been open long enough that people are actually bored of dinosaurs, so with that in mind, she has expanded the operations to include crafting new and exciting hybrid species, especially at the behest of their sponsors. How did you get two different kinds of dinosaurs to, you know, Oh, Indominus wasn't bred. She was designed. Which introduces their lead geneticist, Dr. Wu, played by B.D. Wong. Which just goes to show you, no matter how minor a role you may have had in this movie, if you actually answer the phone when they call back 20 years later, you too can be important. 
This reveals their latest attraction is the never-before-seen, as it never before existed, Indominus Rex, which they have been working on long enough that the thing is already fully grown. Not sure if that's because it's been here for a decade or because of technology magic, as clearly the movie is set in the future. Not too distant as it might be, giant fucking holograms and holographic touchscreen computers don't exactly seem relatable. What is relatable is the relationship between Claire and her nephews. That being she hasn't seen them in years, hardly knows anything about them, and isn't even going to tag along. You're not coming with us? Oh, I... I really wish that I could, but, um... I have to establish I'm a workaholic with a rocky family life thing. You'll understand when you're older. So she's off to work while the children have the whole park to themselves, along with VIP passes, allowing them to skip ahead in the line, and they don't even need silly hats to do it. Rides and fun can wait, though. We have to get back to work so we can introduce one of the miscellaneous grunts, Lowry, played by Jake Johnson, and the most important traits he has. His wardrobe. Where did you get that? Oh, this? I got it on eBay. The mint condition one goes for $300. did not occur to you maybe that's in poor taste? The shirt? The man's sitting here trying to keep the park system running and keep thousands of people safe and happy, and yet, the oh, fuck all that, you find his shirt offensive. Where have I heard all this before? In any case, Lowry here is the guy who, despite showing his own commercial nature, is very distraught at the overt commercialization of the dinosaurs, and doesn't approve of the Indominus Rex project. Not that Claire gives a fuck, what bothers her more is that a Pachycephalosaurus has left its paddock. Security said the invisible fences were a no-fail. That is the second time this month. Well, the Pachys short out their implants when they butt heads. So the dinosaurs have implants that electrocute them if they leave an area. This is going to be incredibly funny later. But there's more characters to introduce and foreshadowing to be had. So let's move on to Simon Masarani, played by Irfan Khan. I got my license. Two more. Well, two more days. And don't worry, being barely able to fly helicopters, charming, and it'll allow me to help out later. It's win-win! Anyhow, he goes on about how money isn't important. It's all about how happy the dinosaurs are being caged up and gawked at for their entire lives. That's what makes a good theme park. This goes completely out the window when he brings Claire to the Indominus Rex's enclosure and proceeds to gawk at how terrifying the creature is and fanboy over it, trying to break the glass at some point, while not giving one shit about how she feels. Did you see us? They say it can sense thermal radiation, like snakes. So, no then. She can't really see thermal radiation through glass, unless we're leaning on it. Still, Maserani isn't convinced the creature is as securely held as they'd like, so he tells Claire they should enlist the help of not an architect or a security official, but the former Navy-turned-animal handler, somehow, Owen Grady, played by Chris Pratt, who is currently doing tricks with his pet velociraptors. Blue! Blue! Is it just me or is Blue like, oh my god, it's Chris Platt! Oh, Chris Platt, he's so cute, I can just eat him up. We see the incredible connection Owen has over the beasts, being able to convince each and every one of them to eat meaty muscles. But why go right to the important stuff with the Indominus Rex pen, when we can instead introduce even more characters and more subplots? This brings us to Vic Hoskins, played by Vincent D'Onfrano. He's sort of Owen's boss, I think? There's paychecks involved. He's also not in charge or some other shit, asking Owen permission for a field test because he believes the Velociraptors would make a great addition to the military. We know that the military needs to reduce casualties. Some people think that robots are the future. And I'm too scared of a Terminator-esque scenario where they turn on their masters. Nope, that won't do it all. The safe bet is the killer fucking monsters. As if we need any hint that this is a stupid idea, one of the handlers winds up getting flung right into the pen, showing just how ready the beasts are to turn on their former caretakers. Or it's showing Hoskins' idea has merit, as Owen swoops in and convinces the raptors, No! You shall not eat our stringy helper! Or this is just a nice shot for the trailer. Whatever the case, it doesn't really lead anywhere, so let's go back to seeing what the kids are up to. Gentle Giant's petting zoo scene actually harkens back to a scene cut from the original Jurassic Park where Letzx and Tim ride around on a baby triceratops. For no apparent reason, so I can see why they cut it. But here, they try to convince us that these already large, already powerful creatures with three big fucking daggers sticking out of their face are perfectly safe, free-range, roaming petting zoo material. Yeah, it's... Kinda like when the Please Touch Museum had that exhibit on smallpox blankets. But petting zoos with creatures that could break your spine is for babies. Thus, Zack is bored out of his mind. However, their guide Zara is distracted long enough that the two boys manage to escape her so they can attend more interesting attractions. 
Wait, let, let, let me get this straight. Tracking devices on everything, cameras fucking everywhere, and VIP passes allowing them to cut in line, which should make it easier to figure out where they are, but... Whoop! Lost in the crowd. Fucking no wonder everyone's gonna die. They up the ante on attractions right away, watching the T-Rex feeding. Sort of, it's kind of hard to see it beyond the crowd, but uh, you don't really care about that anyway, do you? The movie knows better. It's time for family drama, as the boy's mother calls up Claire to bitch and moan about the fact that she didn't drop everything and shut the park down to watch after the two kids as they explore the park. You haven't seen the boys in forever, and, and I know how Zach will treat Gray if they're by themselves, and he could just be so mean. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't have time to watch your snot-nosed brats. I'm too busy watching dinosaurs! I can't play babysitter right now. I'm too busy playing God. How was Bridge Club for you this week? I'll tell you how it was for me. I built a two-story carnivore with DNA from back when we were fucking fish! I don't give a shit about Zach or fucking Gray! Decker, calm down. I'm just your co-writer. Ah! Oh, jeez! Oh, fuck! I could tell you they come to an agreement, but it honestly doesn't fucking matter, so let's move on to Claire reaching Owen's little hovel on the island and telling him she wants his opinion on if their security for the new attraction is up to snuff. This gives him the chance to ignore everything she says and just spout more pretentious bullshit. They're thinking, I gotta eat. I gotta hunt. I gotta... You do know they are all female, right? What's the penis fist motion? Do they have those too? Well, then again, the creatures from the first movie were pretty much Tumblrsaurus. So we go back and forth between the kids enjoying the sights while establishing important things for later, such as a giant fucking shark-eating Mosasaurus, and Claire dragging Owen around to try and get his opinion on their security. Seems they don't need him to know it's fucked, though, because not only do they suddenly fail to find the Indominus Rex on their thermal cameras, but Owen's advice isn't particularly nuanced. Were those claw marks always there? Really glad they got this expert to point out these clues that are so easily overlooked. Fearing the creature escaped, Claire rushes out of the building, which is where she's probably safe, so to, to call the control room, like she easily could have from within the building, and get the location of the creature's GPS tracker. Why they never thought to add that functionality to the holding cage's computers, I don't know, but I'm sure Owen would have suggested it. Of course, he's too busy waltzing around inside the pen with the other workers being complete fucking idiots, so they are caught completely off guard when this happens. I don't want to do coffee. Yeah, what's the problem? It's in the cage! It's in there with you! Go! Ah, fuck, they deserve to be eaten if they think we don't know where it is somehow magically translates to we definitely know it's not in the cage. This complete dumbassery that was completely unnecessary on their part does mean that the few people now trapped with the beast run like hell and open the giant dinosaur-sized door they installed, but of course can't get it closed in time, and the Indominus Rex eats them one by one. Not Owen, though, as he realizes the creature is using its bloodhound quality sense of smell to hunt, so he uses the power of a gasoline bath to mask his scent, or at the very least ruin the creature's appetite. However, they aren't beaten yet. The implant will shock it if it gets too close to a perimeter fence. So it's just all implants in general shock dinosaurs when they're close to perimeter fences. Still gonna be very funny later. So the hunt is on, the park security is alerted, and the side characters look worried as the tension builds to a fever pitch. If mom and dad get divorced, will one of us be with mom and the other with dad? What? We jarringly go back to the kids to watch Gray cry about his parents splitting up. Hey, knock it off. Are you gonna cry? Which has fuck all to do with anything. I get it, you found a child actor that could cry really well, and you wanted to use that, that's great! But this whole divorce subplot, while it, you know, was in the subtext in some earlier scenes, it never fucking comes up again, it has no bearing on anything! You wanna have Grey cry about something that actually fucking matters? Have a Dilophosaurus eat Zack! In that spirit, let's ignore it completely and move on to the park's private army heading in to recapture the beast, and Chris Pratt barging in to explain the obvious plot points to the audience. She marked up that wall as a distraction. She wanted us to think she escaped. Hold on, we are talking about an animal here. A highly intelligent animal. Raised exclusively in that pen, surrounded by solid walls, she still knew, somehow, that there was an outside to escape to. Clever girl. Owen here demands Claire call off the non-lethal recapture team, but why listen to him? They've tracked down the signal and have the Indominus Rex completely surrounded. Or at least the big foam hunk of movie flesh with the trinket still inside. Allowing the creature to get the drop on them! 
Surprising considering she was waiting exactly where they were looking, but she had chameleon superpowers thanks to her mixed genome. And that explains how she set a trap. Not sure if the trap was even needed, considering the Indominus Rex kills the ever-loving fuck out of the entire team, which means Claire must do something about this crisis. No, not get out the big guns and just kill the motherfucker. That would end the movie far too quickly. Instead, she ignores Owen and opts to just close down all the rides on the northern half of the island, right as the boys of questionable importance get on the gyrosphere. Which, in a mother of all coincidences and shitty planning, doesn't actually have a rail system or set path that it's programmed to go on. It's actually just giving them a car in the shape of a ball and trusting they'll come back in one piece. You know, at this point, the giant fucking monster dinosaur running around is more believable. Hell, they actually give an attempt to explain the bonkers-esque, Kirby-esque copy abilities of the damn thing has. Cuttlefish have chromatophores that allow the skin to change color. It hid from thermal technology. Really? Yeah, yeah, the tree frog DNA they use can do the same thing. That's not quite as much of what I'm questioning here as the fact that it actually figured out that they had thermal cameras tracking it, and the people raising the damn thing for God knows how long, for all this observation time they had on it, studying the fucking thing, never fucking noticed that it had this capability, and it fucking used it to fucking do the subterfuge all of a sudden, just amazing fucking coincidental planning, don't you think? They also explain it removed its tracking device because it remembered where it was planted. But that doesn't even begin to explain how the fuck it even knew it was a tracking device well enough to set up a motherfucking ambush with the thing. But fuck it, the point is the creature's loose and the park is in deep shit. Also, Claire's moronic foresight might also be genetic. Dude. Off-road. But they told us to go back. Yeah, I'm just worried that you're not getting the full Jurassic World experience. Go on some rides, pay $10 for cotton candy, ignore obvious signs of danger, go into a restricted area and get eaten. They almost even get their wish! At first it's this boring ass ankylosaurus, not even trying to beat them to death with their club tails. But lo and behold, the Indominus Rex shows up and starts murdering the fuck out of the beasts! Not killing for food, but out of psychotic genetic rage stuff! She quickly turns on the kids and busts their ball! Fortunately, this gives them the chance to escape, reminding me of Predator, both with how they jump from the cliff down the waterfall, and later when they crawl onto the shore in the mud. We jumped. <laughs> I would... Was there a scene where Grey was even remotely apprehensive about trying things? Because... Well, I kind of missed it. In the meantime, Claire has enlisted Owen's help to track the boys down and the Indominus Rex, which is taking a damn long time, so back with the kids, they discover the abandoned ruins of the original visitor center. Evidently, this was a shit location for it, as the new parks, hotels, and restaurants aren't even remotely close by. But what luck, the Jeeps from the first movie are here as well. Not those shitty electric ones either, but gas Jeeps! Eh, big deal, it's not like they're useful or anything after how many decades? Guys, guys, I, I know you explained them getting the battery jump with a spare battery nearby that somehow still fucking worked, but you do know that gas goes bad, right? I mean, fucking peanut butter lasts longer. Gas is only good for like six months. I guess in a crisis situation, maybe you could use nine-month-old gas, so it would really fuck up the engine, but it's been like two decades! The fuck? Oh, what's this? Look at all this useful scrap! Oh, my warp drive will be back up and operational in no time! Uh, whatever, he spared no expense, so magic cars still work. This gets the boys on the road back to safety, just in time to miss Claire and Owen coming up behind them. They also miss the Indominus Rex, who now inches closer and closer, more than capable of killing these two in an instant! Which she doesn't, despite being well within range to smell them. This is actually explained in an earlier deleted scene where Claire and Owen come across the traditional pile of dinosaur shit and apply it to block their scent. Of course, that wasn't important for the plot, not as much as this scene. If mom and dad get divorced, will one of us be with mom and the other with dad? What? Yeah, I know it fleshes out the characters, but either way, that shit never comes up again. But they haven't been slouching back at base. Maserani is using his handily established helicopter flying powers, along with convenient army vets, to hunt and kill the Indominus Rex. 
problem is these guys survive the war by avoiding combat, as they have no fucking idea how to aim at a 50-foot Godzilla-looking motherfucker, which leads to the beast bashing through the remarkably fragile aviary dome, releasing swarms of pterosaurs. <laughs> which you might have noticed are not, in fact, spazzing out and falling from the sky. It's almost like that those implants that they established are in every creature and shock them upon breaching a perimeter fence don't fucking exist anymore for the rest of the movie. This also spells the end for Mr. Maserani. Oh, and the nameless soldiers with him, but eh. More important than any of that, though, is now that the layered containment measures have pretty much been reduced to just cages, any dinosaur loose now has free reign to kill as many innocent people as they can. At least the boys still get back to Zara safe and sound. did that woman do to piss off the director? Now the children are all alone. But wait! Claire and Owen return to the main drag as well! This gives them both a chance to show off their badassitude. With tranquilizers, anyway. Is that any Claire? Well, it's either that or you accidentally walked onto the set of the next Resident Evil movie. In which case, you're probably better off with the Indominus, anyway. So everyone is back together! Yay! But this short-lived celebration amongst the screams of innocent people being eaten by flying reptiles takes a dark turn, as it just so happens that Hoskins is using the chaos as an opportunity to force Owen's hand, saying they can only bring down the Indominus Rex with military might, and the mightiest military power they have are the Raptors! This is happening! With or without you. I'm still not convinced that the shoot the motherfucker from the sky strategy won't work. You want to try that again with someone who actually knows how to lead with a gun? No? Just gonna have dog show raptors saving the world. Okay. At this time, everyone else on the island is huddled at the docks waiting for evacuation. For some reason, Claire, in her infinite wisdom, decided that it is not the safest place for the two boys, and it said they should stay right by her. Right by her and the suddenly released pack of raptors tracking the Indominus Rex. Insert Bubsy quote here. Along these lines, the raptor team is given the Indominus' scent with the help of the foam hunk of flesh, and they quickly rush out to pose for the movie poster. It's also an easy enough job as their target happened to be just a few hundred feet away, but Hoskins' brilliant idea runs into a big fucking problem. I know why they wouldn't tell us what it's made of. Oh, that thing's part raptor. Hold up! Hold up! Why the fuck is raptor language genetic? I mean, you spent the last movies talking about how fucking complicated it was, but here it's no better than growling or barking? I mean, you do realize that different pods of whales actually have different dialects, right? Not to mention that these raptors Owen's been training since hatching them turn on him right the fuck away because Indominatrix here is big and shit, so that's good enough. Also, is it just me or does how fast a small group of raptors managed to rip the entire unit of soldiers apart bear a striking resemblance to the xenomorphs in Requiem, killing off the entire army in one fucking minute? <laughs> Before I kill you, Platt, I just want you to know that I still think you're so damn cute. But suddenly, explosions and screaming, running, dying, the usual, and everyone must escape. As this plane obviously didn't fucking work, it's time to come up with a new one. But don't expect to get one out of Hoskins this time around. Change plans. Mission took a jog to the left. I'm taking everything off site. Okay, our little side project's about to get a shot in the arm. I don't want a bunch of lawyers messing around with something they don't understand. You get it? Fuck up. So, the Indominus Rex project was actually masterminded by Hoskins and Wu. It was supposed to break free, and they were supposed to bring the trained raptors in to save the day and bring in a mucho military contract for money. Okay, okay, I get the play. No, where the fuck did you put raptor DNA in the Indominus? This is some kindergarten levels of pants shitting here. 
Anyway, on with the story, everyone is evacuating now, down to the crew themselves. However, Lowry stands up and declares that he will stay behind to man the control station, even if it puts his life in jeopardy. Someone has to stay behind. Boyfriend. You see, movie, this is what you do with characters that get constantly shit on. Comic relief, even in heroism. Not being ripped apart by pteranodons and eaten by a mosasaur. Strangely, now that the lab is being evacuated, somehow this is the first time Claire has had free reign to take a peek inside and realize there's weird shit going on. Hoskins also shows up to explain the plot some more, that the Indominus Project was always meant to be a proof of concept for military applications, which makes his raptor speeches earlier kind of stupid, but that's not going to get in the way of his villain rant. Millions of years of evolution. What we learn? Nature is the gift <laughs> of oh, shit! Well, there was a pause there where he tries to talk the raptor out of it. Personally, I like my edit better. Point is, climax time! Everyone goes to run away, but raptors are still pretty fast, motherfuckers, despite this movie slowing them from cheetah to bicycle. Either way, our small group of bipedal meals end up surrounded. But wait, with his powers of cross-species diplomacy, Owen can melt the raptor's hearts before our very eyes. I just can't stay mad at you, Quisplat. Just as fast as they turn on him before, suddenly they turn on the androgynous Rex and begin fighting to save the humans. This would mean that Hoskins was right all along, but fuck it, he's dead now. The fight is going strong, but Gray thinks he has a better strategy. We need more. <sighs> what? Teeth. We need more teeth. Oh, fuck you, Simpkins. What the hell am I supposed to do? They don't grow back, you know. Claire seems to think he means something else, something a lot bigger, and which sells more movie tickets. It's not too bad of a plan, it really seems like you just can't kill this motherfucker. Despite the Rex running at 30 miles an hour and the fastest human wearing just under 28 miles an hour and Claire still wearing heels, somehow she managed to outpace the Rex and... Wait a minute. How the fuck is that supposed to work? Jurassic Park spent so long talking about the Rex's sight being based on movement, and we even got examples of flare distracts that work and don't. For instance, Dr. Grant. He got his attention by moving it and then threw it while himself remaining relatively still. Ian Malcolm, on the other hand... did pretty much exactly what Claire just did and got fucking maimed for it. A flare is not like a cat laser pointer movie. Of course, it could just as easily be pointed out that obviously this part isn't supposed to be a what-if scenario played quasi-realistically. This climax is clearly an excuse to have a dinosaur brawl, with the Indominus Rex having a tag team match against the T-Rex and its surprise partner, the last surviving raptor, who stepped out of frame for a while. It's a pretty nice spectacle, but if you want to know who would win in such a fight... Too fucking bad, Mosasaur Ex Machina gets him. Yeah, point is, happy ending! The Indominus Rex becomes no more than a deep water snack. The T-Rex and the Raptor decide, fuck it, the movie's gone on long enough, it's time to cash their paychecks. And the humans leave the area surrounded by dinosaurs, but without any trouble. Kind of like the ending of the birds. Oh, and the parents are happy to see him. Now, nothing is said about any divorce idea or any plans to stay together. It seriously had no fucking point. But we do get a resolution of the relationship between Owen and Claire. So what do we do now? Probably stick together. For survival. You know what that means. Fucking! Only someone will get some enjoyment out of this ending. Anyway, that was a, a lot of Jurassic World. And it is very entertaining, no doubt about it. But I really hope no one out there actually thinks it's even close to a perfect movie. What's the first thing to complain about? Right off the bat, it's gotta be the glaring plot holes. No, not the divorce thing. Much as I thought it was unnecessary, it didn't bring up things that didn't make sense, it was just there. I'm talking about the details given on the tracking devices, fleshing out the world and establishing plot points, only to be completely discarded whenever the movie feels like it. 
The worst concentration of plot holes centered around the Indominus Rex, with them trying to do the monster movie thing of having it surprise us with weird abilities and foil the plans to contain it. But the half-ass explanations they pull out to cover how it was able to do these things didn't even begin to explain how logically this would have happened. Not to mention the only reason it got out in the first place was that everyone is a fucking idiot. At least in the first movie, Nedry's plan to steal embryos wasn't relying on someone else fucking up so he got the chance. It was orchestrated. This was just a haphazard series of accidents that try to pretend they're a plan in the third reel. But there are things to like about this movie, of course. Plenty, in fact. As old fans and Jurassic Park enthusiasts alike will notice the throwbacks laden throughout the film, which were enjoyable. The acting also was okay. This isn't the kind of movie to look for Oscar bait speeches, but nobody really held it down. Zack was kind of a shit character at first, but it had nothing to do with the actor's ability. It's just how he was written. Mainly what I can say the movie exists for is eye candy, and lots of it. Much in the same way the original Jurassic Park pushed the boundaries on special effects, Jurassic World doesn't half-ass any of its CGI. The theme park setting also gave us a good excuse to see many impressive displays, but when it comes down to it, that's what Jurassic World stands up as at its heart. Eye candy and popcorn entertainment. Still damn good entertainment, though, and despite the major flaws in storytelling, I still feel it's deserving of four Jimmy Buffett margaritas out of five. Which is what I gave the first one, too, so... You know what? Maybe it actually did live up to its legacy. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I've been Dr. Shadow. And remember, any visitors entering restricted areas will have their balls broken. Never like me, you don't mention him, ever. No, I'm at work. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all. This review marks my 200th episode of The Web Show. It's been a hell of a ride. I went from 480p to 720p to 1080p, and now the show's in 4K. 4K discs are supposed to come out in 2016, so hey, who's excited for the Pineapple Express review? Eh? Uh, my first month, I made three cents in ad revenue. I'm still not making nearly as much as I was at Kroger, but hundreds a month is definitely an improvement. And despite the hardships, Creepy and I managed to get to Japan for Gamerathon 3. So much has happened, but it's my hope that the heart of the show can stay the same. I can improve the quality without discarding the spirit. I hope to keep that up well into the future. Here's to another 200 episodes. Or, hell, 2,000. Give me some nanomachines to keep me going, and I'll add even more zeros to that.